Secretary Clinton, thank you for being here. Thank you, Ezra. I'm glad to talk to you again. So I wanted to start with the part of the book that surprised me the most, which was you almost ran on the beginning of a universal basic income in America, what mm -hmm. you were going to call Alaska for America. Right. Tell me a bit about that idea and why it didn't make it into the final campaign. Well, I wanted very much to uh, convey a uh, commitment to trying to figure out ways to raise incomes. I mean, most of the emphasis in the campaign was, as you know, on jobs and some big projects like really the infrastructure uh, program that I put forth. But I was also really interested in what else we were going to be needing to do. And so I looked at a couple of different approaches to what's called UBI, universal basic income, you know, the experiments that have been tried elsewhere. Uh, and the Alaska for America idea was really intriguing to me because in effect it was to argue that our natural patrimony uh, really does belong to every American, to try to break the mindset that, you know, the extraction of resources is a totally private sector uh, effort that we as Americans have a stake in it uh, for all the reasons that you can understand. And the Alaska model where they give a, they write a check to every single Alaskan every year based on a formula uh, about the, uh, the oil and gas uh, revenues was really intriguing to me. And we, we dug deep and we tried to explain it to some people and it just was hard for people to grasp what we were talking about because most Americans in the lower 48, as we like to say, didn't have any idea about what was going on in Alaska. So I, I kept looking for an opportunity to put it in but not to make it a uh, centerpiece of the campaign. What would have gone into a program like that? What, when you talk about our natural patrimony, what right. would have been the inputs to that income? Well, that was one of the challenges we had trying to figure out exactly when you look nationwide. Are we talking about uh, fossil fuels, uh, which then might sort of perversely encourage the continue, continued extraction of fossil fuels, which would be a, you know, an outcome that we weren't necessarily uh, thinking was in the best interest. Other kinds of, of you know, uh, natural uh, patrimony, whether it's, you know, minerals or anything else that you could look at and say, you know, extracting that, making a private profit off of that is really part of America's uh, legacy. So we, we, there were lots of really interesting questions. We debated it for a very long time. The fossil fuels, climate change issue was one of the complications. So the reason I start with that is that when you talk about it in the book, you say at the end, you know, maybe I should have proposed that and left the details to be worked out yes. later. Yes. And it, it seems to me that this is one of the pieces of the campaign that you've been left reevaluating. It is. That you say that you now have more of an appreciation for the power of big galvanizing mm -hmm. ideas. Mm -hmm. Do you think that one of the lessons of watching Bernie Sanders, of watching Donald Trump, is that perhaps the correct role for policy in a campaign is to inspire, and that the place for a sort of technocratically sound, more pragmatic policy is in a legislative process? Well, that certainly is a fair, um, uh, fair conclusion to draw from the way I try to raise the questions. And, and if I could, Ezra, because you're a policy person and I love that about you, um, let me just talk about this a little bit more because this was a struggle from the very beginning. This wasn't something that I only thought about retroactively. And I felt um, that I was in the following posture. Um, I was running to succeed a two-term president from my own party who I happen to believe did a really good job on some very difficult issues. And whether it was saving the economy, saving the auto industry, getting us on the path to universal health coverage with the Affordable Care Act, I knew how hard it was to actually get to where we got. And I worried that if I were to say, well, let's go all the way you know, with this and we're, we'll leave the details to later, the natural question is, well, why didn't that happen before? And I knew that that would be my burden to bear because I would have the responsibility, having been in the administration, to be able to answer that question. Secondly, I don't think I'm held to the same standard as anybody else. I believed that if I were to say, let's do, um, you know, a, what, let's say a carbon tax, let's do single payer tomorrow, let's do whatever it is that might be viewed as universal and inspiring or whatever. Unlike 
either my primary opponent or my general election opponent, who were never pinned down, except in one case in the primary with respect to uh, Senator Sanders, I, I would have been hammered all the time. Like, okay, well, how are you going to do that? And how are you going to pay for it? And where's the money going to come from? And if I had said, we're going to leave it to the legislative process over here, they'll figure it out, people would have said, well, you've been around. You know how it works. How are you going to do that? You don't have 60 votes. You're not I mean, I think I would have been hit with a thousand different legitimate questions. And I think I would have felt an obligation to answer. So finally, you know, I do think policy matters. And I think where I came out really made sense for the country, made sense for a Democratic um, candidate. Um, but it was hard to compete with, you know, just the, the, the big claims and the assertions that I got from, you know, both sides. And maybe I could have been, in fact, I'm sure I could have been somewhat more adept at trying to maneuver through that so that I got the benefit of saying, here's what we're going to do. I thought saying, look, we're going to get to universal coverage because that's my goal. We're at 90 percent now. I think getting from 90 to 100 is a lot easier than starting over. I mean, I thought that made sense to people. And I think in the end, a lot of people who were going to vote for me uh, believed that. But you know, that, that's what you do when you take a retrospective, like what could I have done differently? So as someone who would have been asking those legitimate questions, yes, who would have would thought have they would have been and legitimate. And you would have been pinning me down and, and it would have been quite hard. And, and here's my question on that though. Do you think that those questions matter because people would care about them or because you would care about them? Something that I've observed watching mm -hmm. Trump and, and mm -hmm. other politicians mm -hmm. of this era is that a lot of what we thought can hurt a politician is actually a relationship between them and the press. It's their own shame, their own sense that they've been pinned down, their own desire to actually respond to what they feel is a fair critique. If you just don't have that desire, if you don't care about that particular kind of critique, it appears to lose at least some of its power. Ezra, you're 100% right. I feel like uh, we're having a therapy session right here <laughs> on camera. You're 100% right, and, and I can't change who I am. I, I, I knew that. I knew that I am not someone who will say things that aren't true, that will not take responsibility. I had to run as me. I love it when people say, oh, if only we knew her more, or if she were more authentic. I've been around a long time. I am what I am. I care about being absolutely as accurate as possible so people know how to judge what I'm saying. But I think this was not just a slight shift. This was a ground shaking shift. Because I'm someone who's observed presidential elections a very long time, and I always saw there would be a moment, maybe one or two, where in a debate or in a really important interview, the candidate would say, well, how, how are you going to do that? And explain to me how that would work. That was certainly my experience in 08. It, I saw my husband go through it. In fact, it probably saved his campaign. I saw, you know, President Obama go through it and be able to say both in 08 and 12, look, here's what we're going to do, and I think this is realistic, and we're going to get it done, but it's going to make a difference. I mean, so he went from the specific to the, you know, the, the upstretched hands, the, the aspirational promise, and yet it had to be connected to something that was real. And, you know, I've been around a long time. I know how hard this is, and I didn't want to be either not telling the truth about what was going to happen and not being responsible about what I thought we could do and get done together, which I thought could be a pretty big deal. But clearly in a reality TV campaign like the one that we were in, you know, seeing in 2016, it it was not it was not the same at all. I never had those moments that I thought would come. So you, you talk about that you are what you are. And one I of the, am what I am. You are what you are. <laughs> one of the things that was interesting to me in the book was actually how you frame your own history in political organizing. Mm -hmm. So I've read your speech from, from Wellesley, mm -hmm. and I had it had always sounded like the words of a radical to me. Mm. But when you explain how you thought about running for student body president, you said that I ran for student government president in 1968 because I thought I could do a good job convincing college administrators to make changes students wanted. You right. talk about your work at the Children's Defense Fund right. and focus on field work and making reports. This is all in a period when a lot of people around you were interested in upending systems. Why, how were you more, how did you become more of a 
pragmatists who wanted to work within the systems in a radical era? Well, there are always people who want to upend the system, and I respect the um, desire for uh, being part of big change. I think that's important, and particularly when you're younger and you want to see that happen. Uh, but I also became convinced early on that in my understanding of change, it was rare that in America you got those huge moments of opportunity. We saw it with President Johnson, with voting rights, civil rights, Medicare, Medicaid. You had enormous Democratic majorities in the House and the Senate. So a governing party could actually implement what it chose to uh, uh, pursue. But that's, that's not that common in American political history. And as I watched, what the hard, slow boring of hard boards that Weber talks about meant in our country. It was, you know, really digging in, getting to know what you're talking about, making the case. And sometimes you still ran into a, an immovable political obstacle. But then you regrouped and you went on again, which is what I did, you know, with healthcare in the 1990s when we ended up with the Children's Health Insurance uh, Program. So I'm really interested in change. I'm really interested in the sort of principles and values that I believe uh, America stands for. But I also know what it takes to get where we need to go politically. And, and that's what I decided was, you know, the most uh, effective uh, way to achieve what I was looking for. But this feels to me like the argument that has been at the center of both your 08 and 16 candidacies and that you have had trouble making. So in, in both those elections, in the primary in 08, and then both in the primary and in the general uh, this year, last year, you ran against people who in some way or another were saying they were gonna upend the whole system. Mm. They were gonna bring hope and change. They were gonna bring a political revolution. They were gonna drain the swamp, whatever it might've been. And, and in those cases, you've always taken the stance that you actually need to understand the system. You need to mm -hmm. work within it. The, mm -hmm. the angels are not gonna come down with their mm -hmm. violins. Mm -hmm. And that has been, I think, simultaneously a realistic and very hard to sell message. I'm gonna tell you, I, I had a piece I had written for If You Had Won, mm. and it was called Hillary Clinton's Political Realism, and it was mm. about the ways in which your vision of success was much less um, about upending America's political system and much more about the change you can bring within it. Why is that such a hard message to sell to the American people? I don't think it used to be quite as hard. I think it could be uh, made harder because of the environment in which we find ourselves right now. But you see, I also think I'm very realistic about the forces that are arrayed against the kind of change I want to see. You know, there's a big move for change coming from the right uh, that I think would be disastrous for our country. They want radical pull them up by the roots change. They want to have a constitutional convention to rewrite our constitution to make it friendlier to business, to inject you know, religious and ideological elements. So talk about radical change. They are pursuing it, they are funding it, and they are electing people who are either true believers or willing vehicles for it. So what do we do on the other side? Uh, because we don't control the media environment the same way the right does. It's harder for our message to get out. Um, so it's okay to say, all right, let's, let's really work for change, but you're going to have to build an, you know, an edifice under that that has the kind of hard-fought political realities that are going to be necessary to stand against the right. So I, I, you know, I thought, and obviously came close, won the popular vote and all of that, but I thought at the end of the day, people would say, look, we do want change, and we want the right kind of change, and we want change that is realistic and is gonna make a difference in my life and my family's life and my paycheck. That's what I was offering. And I didn't in any way want to feed in to this, uh, not just, radical political argument that was being made on the other side, but a very um, negative cultural argument about who we are as Americans. So 
you know, it, 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 there was so much happening in this campaign, and a lot of it for the first time, some of it as a result of long trends, that I was running just to try to figure out, okay, people are really that anti-immigrant? Are they really? Or is that just a, you know, convenient excuse to rally a base? I mean, how far does that really go? I mean, it was a tough, a tough terrain that we were um, moving through and trying to understand. But so this is something I think about in my own writing. Is it possible to be too realistic about the forces arrayed against change, about the institutional constraints of the American political system, so realistic that you miss opening so realistic that it is hard to inspire people. And as such, it actually begins driving the outcomes themselves. I, I feel like this is the critique of this kind of politics. Yes. No, I think, it, I, I think it's a fair critique. I, 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 I understand that critique. Um, but I don't think the press did their job in this election, with very few exceptions. So the hard questions about what was real and what was realistic and what could happen with the right kind of election outcome were never really joined. And so, you know, I found it frustrating, obviously, because I think I could have defended and lifted up a lot of what I believed we could do. But really, Ezra, when you get 32 minutes in a whole year to cover all policy, how does that work? And you compare it even with 08, where you had 200 minutes on broadcast TV, you think, well, is it that people are really not interested, or is it that it's just not as, uh, you know, enticing to the press because the other guy's running a reality TV show, which is, like, hard to turn away from, and whatever he says, we think is kind of goofy, but, hey, it's good TV. And she's over there saying, okay, here's how we're going to raise taxes on the wealthy, and here's what we're going to do to close loopholes, and here's where I think I can do it. And eh, you know what? She's going to win anyway. So let's cover the other guy because he's a lot more fun. And I think in, in addition to everything you say, which I think is, is, is fair and needs to be uh, considered, it was such a difficult environment even to have that conversation. So who could tell what was or was not realistic? It was, you know, kind of... All, all bets were off uh, in the coverage of the campaign. So Democrats are going to face a question like this as we speak. So right now in Washington, we're actually interviewing Bernie Sanders, another mm -hmm. of my reporters, is, who is proposing his single-payer bill mm -hmm. this week. And a lot of Senate Democrats are expected to sign on to it. Mm -hmm. A lot of the 2020 contenders mm -hmm. people talked to are going to sign on to it. Mm -hmm. This bill would be quite sweeping. It would upend um, every insurance arrangement, mm -hmm. uh, every private insurance arrangement mm -hmm. in America. Do you think that the Democratic Party should sign on, even aspirationally, to a bill that is that radical in its vision? Well, I don't know what the particulars are. As you might remember, during the campaign, uh, he introduced a single-payer bill every year he was in Congress. And when somebody finally read it, he couldn't explain it and couldn't really uh, tell people how much it was going to cost. So I, I'm, I haven't seen whatever it is they're going to be introducing and signing on to. So I don't know. I'm for universal health care coverage that is high quality and affordable for every American. And I think there's a lot of ways of getting there uh, that I've, I've advocated for to open up Medicare, to open up Medicaid, to, you know, do more on prescription drug costs, to really make sure that uh, we get costs down and we do everything we can to sort of break the stranglehold that a lot of the pharmaceutical companies, which are unfortunately still driving prices, have on uh, health care costs. And I think it's going to be challenging if within that bill there are uh, tax increases equivalent to what it would take to pay for single payer. And if you're really telling people about half of the country that they uh, can't no, they can no longer have the policies that they have through their employers. I've been down this road. This is not the first time we have tried to confront this. You know, when I was working on health care back in 93 and 94, uh, if we could have waved the magic wand and started all over, I said it numerous times, you know, maybe we would start with something resembling 
single payer plus other payers, like some other countries that have universal coverage and are much better at controlling costs than we do, uh, in, in primarily in Europe. Um, but we were facing the reality, talk about reality, we were facing the reality of not just strong, powerful forces, but people's own fears as well as their um, you know, their, their uh, appreciation for what they already had. And so, I'll, you know, when the bill is actually introduced, I'll, I'll read it, I'll look at it, um, but if it doesn't have some kind of um, grandfathering in, if it doesn't have some kind of, you know, cost estimates, because look at what happened in Vermont. You know, it wasn't for lack of trying in Vermont. You know, the political, democratic political establishment was behind single payer, and they worked four years to achieve it. And this is in, you know, a, a small state uh, where it might have been possible. They were talking about an increase in the payroll tax of nine and a half percent, or I think, no, maybe 11 and a half percent. They were talking about a sliding income scale that went up to nine and a half percent. I mean, it just was so difficult to put the pieces together. Now, clearly, if you had a national plan, that would be uh, more likely to avoid state by state comparisons. But I, you know, I think it's going to be a, a big challenge. I, our goal should be universal health care coverage, universal, affordable, quality health care coverage for everybody, uh, bar none. But let me ask you about the other side of it, about Obamacare, mm -hmm. which seems for the moment to have withstood uh, mm -hmm. the attacks on it. But that was a policy that was really built with an eye towards realism, yes. an eye towards what could pass, but also an eye towards how could you overlay something onto mm -hmm. the existing system that wouldn't disrupt too many of mm -hmm. the existing arrangements. Right. And those pieces of the plan, the exchanges, mm -hmm. and the private insurers, have been the most substantively difficult to implement and to defend and then also the most politically difficult. It's left the administration, first Obama, now Trump, at the mercy of private insurers deciding whether or not to sell, mm -hmm. premium increases they can't defend. And what has really ended up being popular in that and defensible in that is a Medicaid expansion. Right. So is that a place where right. Democrats over under overread what realism required and ended up in a position where what they had wasn't that inspiring and also wasn't, in the end, that easy to uh, either implement or to sustain? Well, you know, I, I, I think you have to unpack what you just asked because even embedded in it... People your, usually do, yeah. Yeah, was, was your <laughs> reference to Medicaid. Um, it was really unfortunate that because of the drafting of the bill, it gave an opening to the Supreme Court to eliminate the Medicaid requirement, the expansion requirement. But what has happened is that Medicaid has become very popular, even in Republican states, because it does save money, and it is a universal program below a certain income level, and it takes care of middle-income uh, people when it comes to nursing homes and disabilities and all the rest. So I think we should be focused politically, realistically, and aspirationally on expanding, continuing the expansion of Medicaid and going to those states that have not yet expanded it and making the political case every day for as long as it takes. I was in favor of a Medicare buy-in. If you start, you know, slowly moving the age down, um, it would make a very big difference. There, you know, people's health begins to have more problems, you know, after 55. So let's get Medicaid down to 60 and then maybe down to 55. I am in favor of a public option. And the Democrats thought they were going to get a public option and at the very end didn't have the votes for a public option for reasons that I think were inexcusable at the time. But that was just the fact. You know, you got to pass it. So is that realism or aspiration? Well, at the end of the day, it's votes. And it didn't pass. And so there are pieces that became... Uh, less popular, partly because of a really well-funded, nonstop campaign against it. But then all of a sudden, with all this talk about, you know, repeal and replace, which was just nonsense, they never had a plan to replace, it was just a political talking point, and I don't think Democrats did a good enough job defending it against those attacks. But so when it came time to take something away that people had gotten used to, Everybody said no. And that's my larger point about what our goal really is. If you're going to tell 50% of America 
you are no longer going to have your employer-based health care. But, oh, trust us, it's going to be really good when we finally work out all the kinks. You're going to have massive resistance by people who are going to say, I'm happy with what I've got. But if you say, you know what, we need to lower the age for Medicare, and here's how we can do that, and we need to continue the expansion of Medicaid, we will be at universal coverage. Then once we're at universal coverage and people know what that feels like, then we can begin to say, okay, here's what we're going to do to make it work better, to get the costs down. I think that's, you know, I think that's not just realistic. I think it's thrilling. You know, as somebody who was one of the main advocates for the Children's Health Insurance Program, I see the difference it's made in people's lives. And all through the campaign, people would come up to me and say, I was on that program, or, you know, my family wouldn't have been able to afford my sister's care if it hadn't been for that. I find that exhilarating because that, to me, is what public service is supposed to be about. The Children's Health Insurance Program is set to expire at the end of this month. What are, what are the forces going to be that will say, no, you're not going to take this away from eight, nine million kids. Where are they going to go? So, see, I think what's really motivating about being in politics and public service is you can actually see the positive changes, whether it's civil rights or economics or health care, whatever it might be. And I think at the end of the day, that's more important than, you know, how realistic was it or how aspirational was it? So one of the pieces of the book that really outlined, I think, the disagreement between you and, and some of the public is right around here. So we're talking here about the practice of politics, what is realistic mm -hmm. and what isn't. But there's a, a real feeling among a lot of folks that the long-term practice of mainstream politics is itself a corrupting exercise. Mm. And I think back to, to 2008, uh, mm. I was at Yearly Coast when you were there for a debate with the other Democratic candidates. Mm -hmm. And there was this really interesting exchange about lobbyists. Mm -hmm. And you defended them as, as part of the political system. Mm -hmm. They have a role to play. They represent mm -hmm. people you don't like, but also people you do like. Mm -hmm. um, there's a version of that in your defense of the speeches, which mm -hmm. you sort of say, look, look bad, shouldn't have done it. But mm -hmm. you see it as somewhat ridiculous, the mm -hmm. idea that Goldman Sachs paying you could have changed mm -hmm. what you think. Mm -hmm. This feels to me like an actually pretty central fault line in our politics now, the feeling that a lot of the public has, that if you've been in politics a long time, in mainstream politics, mm -hmm that you have probably been, you've probably gone a little bit bad from it. And Barack Obama coming in as an outsider in 08, Donald Trump as an outsider, Bernie Sanders who'd held back from a lot of the political system during his career in Washington, that seemed to be a place where there was a lot of friction. Gosh. So how do you think about politics versus this anti-politics sentiment? I, I, look, anti-politics is part of the American DNA. It goes back to the very beginning. I have, you know, no doubt that uh, it's just, you know, built into America's uh, skepticism and disdain for the people in politics. So that's just part of the, you know, the background of being in politics. But I think it's important to, again, try to recognize what's real and what's not. You know, I can't help it. I'm like the Velveteen Rabbit. I, I believe in reality. I like living in the reality-based world. I don't like alternative facts. I don't like the very concerted, well-funded effort to try to distort news. I don't like any of that. I think a democracy like ours depends upon trying to have a vigorous, fact-based debate. So nobody on the Republican side cares about any of these issues, Ezra. You know that. I mean, I voted for McCain-Feingold. I said in my campaign, one of the first things I would do is introduce a constitutional amendment to repeal uh, Citizens United. So I take a backseat to nobody in standing up for sensible, hard-hitting uh, campaign finance uh, rules. But everybody's got politics. You know, I go after Bernie really hard on the NRA. That's politics for him. And, and the idea that he's set off from politics, he's been in politics his whole adult life. Donald Trump wasn't in politics, but he was somebody who funded people on both sides in order to curry favors. Until we get to public financing, which I wholeheartedly endorse, and we have this crazy system where you have to go out and raise the money, we don't have a party structure that funds campaigns, we don't have public financing, then if Democrats unilaterally disarm and say, well, you know, we're, you know, we're holier than Caesar's wife and we won't say or do anything that might raise a question, there is no compunction on the other side. And 
There is such an imbalance right now in our politics in the amount of money that's on the other side. The Koch brothers say they're going to spend $400 million in the 2018 campaign. So, yeah, I think, you know, people have to be willing to say, OK, you know, I, I understand how this might look. It's not really how I felt or how I acted, but OK, I understand that. So, you know, let's, let's uh, agree on that. But at the end of the day, it is very much uh, a, an unbalanced political environment right now between the resources that are behind Republicans uh, in their campaigns, because it's not just a straight line between who gave you money, it's all the rest of the um, operation and what, you know, stands behind Democrats. And, you know, if we don't care about that, then you know, fine, but I don't think that's going to come out very well for us. But in terms of demonstrating that kind of purity, isn't there a dimension here where Republicans who do not have a very high opinion of the government do not mind particularly the feeling that the government is corrupt, that it does not work on your behalf, that it might even work on behalf of special interests, that that is not actually a particular threat to their version of politics, whereas for Democrats who do want people to trust the government, who do want people to have that faith in public institutions, there is a higher bar yeah, for demonstrating and think, public purity. And I think Democrats, by and large, try to reach it. I mean, Barack Obama took more money from Wall Street in 08 than any Democrat has ever taken and turned around and imposed the toughest regulations under Dodd-Frank since the Great Depression. That's what I tell people that all the time. If you give me money, you will know, because I will tell you publicly and privately what I'm for. So if you're in a high income tax bracket, I want to tax you. If you still want to give me money, you are going in with your eyes open. And so I think it's, it's theoretically an interesting conversation, but you look at somebody like President Obama who inherited this disastrous economy uh, and, you know, I think did an incredible job pulling it back out of the abyss, took a lot of money from a lot of different interests, but it didn't affect how he governed. And so let's get to the second can level I, can here. Can I interrupt you on this? Because I do think that's strong, though, that it didn't affect how he governed. Right. Right. I, th I think I think a lot of President Obama's policies were, were pretty sound, but also a lot of people feel could have done more to punish bankers, that he could have gone further on health care. There were deals cut before the before the fact with the pharmaceutical industry, with the insurance industry. And there are other political realism considerations in all of these questions. But one thing here is that it's true, I think, directionally what you're saying, that a lot of these cut against some of the mm -hmm. interests that funded him. But what I think a lot of people feel, and I think what there is evidence for, is that these kinds of donations, et cetera, they do give people more of a voice. They do give these interests more of a voice. And that does affect things, certainly on the margins, certainly in the details well, of these bills. Well, but, you know, it's always been thus. I mean, if you've seen the musical Hamilton, you know if you are running a raucous... I actually haven't gotten tickets to well, that. Well, <laughs> we'll see if we can help you on that. If you're running a, a raucous, pluralistic, diverse democracy where there are literally millions of different voices, um, you are going to hear from all kinds of voices. You know, I was a senator for eight years. I bet the vast majority of people who came through the doors of my Senate office to talk to me, to advocate, whatever they were doing, were not political donors or certainly not political donors to me. They were constituents. They were citizens. They had something to say. Um, and so Part of what we, we've shrunk the political process to such a narrow set of questions. And that's in the interest of both the far right and the far left, both of whom want to blow up the system and undermine it and all the rest of the stuff they talk about. I think we operate better when we're kind of between center right and center left, because that's where at least up until recently, maybe it's changed now, um, at, until recently, that's where most Americans were. You know, look, they, they, weren't, they didn't get up every day you know, obsessed with what the government and politics was going to do. They want to know what were the results and is it going to make a difference to my life. And I thought we had, you know, a pretty good balance. But I, again, will argue that this has gone on for decades. The right has been on a mission to disrupt and overturn uh, the political system to the benefit of their commercial, ideological, and partisan interests. I don't see how you can argue with that. And it has been pretty effective, all, all said. Their gerrymandering, their suppression of votes, they have a clear uh, 
um, agenda. And it's fascinating that, you know, Trump wasn't really uh, particularly interested in any of this, but he was, it turned out to be a great vehicle for them to promote these interests. And so we're watching the internal debate within their party play out. On our side, uh, you know, I just disagree. I, I was in that Senate for eight years. I know how hard it is to get to 60 votes. Now, you can say we shouldn't have to get to 60 votes, but the fact is, whether you're in the majority or in the minority, and I've been in both, that has been the rule, get to 60 votes, because that then demonstrates at least a broader cross-section of representative Americans being in favor of something. So when you talk about the bankers, if you look at the laws we had at the time, maybe more could have been done, but I've heard very credible, very tough people say, not really because of the burden of proof and the evidence. I'm not defending it, I'm just saying that it's not for lack of trying that a lot of things were not uh, undertaken. There were barriers to trying that, you know, had to be knocked down and changed. And the same with Dodd-Frank. I mean, if Dodd-Frank had been in effect before the crash, more could have been done, but it wasn't. It had to come after. So I want to talk uh, and move us a little bit to the 2016 election and what happened. As mm, the, what happened? The, the subject of the book. My book, yes. There is a premise that I that is not really articulated one way or the other book, and I want to see where you fell on it. Mm -hmm. Was Donald Trump more or less a normal Republican candidate who one should have expected to begin with 42, 44 percent of the vote? And so you're just explaining how did a Republican candidate win the election? Mm -hmm. Or is Donald Trump an abnormal candidate who you should have expected to begin with 30, 35 percent of the vote? And so you have to have this very large explanatory leap to how he came close enough to actually win. What are you explaining? I think given the hyper-partisanship in the country right now, once he became the Republican nominee, the odds were very high that Republicans would come home to him as their nominee. Because regardless of what he said or how he behaved or what came out about him, uh, he was their path to tax cuts. He was their path to a Supreme Court seat. There is an agenda on the other side that really does motivate the right. Uh, so I think at the end of the day, something like 90% of Republicans voted for him and 90% of Democrats voted for me. That's unfortunate in lots of ways. I wish we weren't in such a hyper-partisan political era. But that's what I always expected. I always thought the election would be close. I never was one of those people who said, oh my gosh, he's so unacceptable and this, that. I, I always thought it would be close. Um, I didn't expect to be totally ambushed at the end, which is what I believe and obviously have written about it, uh, cost me the election. Um, but I always thought it would be close. It's not like there was going to be some wholehearted rejection of Trump by Republicans who frankly thought they could handle him. They thought, you know what, it'll be an entertaining four years and, you know, Mike Pence and Mitch McConnell take care of everything for us. I mean, that, that was the thinking that I, I believe went into a lot of the, you know, Republicans, some of whom sort of took a deep breath before they did it, but they didn't take him seriously. They didn't take a potential presidency seriously. They thought getting a Republican in there, that's going to deliver for these things that I care about. But that's a kind of remarkable view of politics. It's actually one that I share, but, but it, it's still a remarkable one to imagine that we are now in a time where for reasons related to polarization and, and, and other things you talk about, anybody, anybody who wins a party primary and parties no longer have control of their mm -hmm, primaries, mm -hmm. anybody who wins a party primary begins within spitting distance of winning the presidential election. Abs I, I believe that. Does that mean we're more vulnerable to, to demagogues, yes. to dangerous candidates, to authoritarians than yes, we've been we in are. the past? Yes, we are, Ezra. I mean, if I had lost to what I guess we could call a normal Republican, one of the other 16 people on the stage during their primary. Jim Gilmore. Well, somebody <laughs> that might have been able to win. Um, look, I would have been disappointed. I would have been upset and heartbroken. But uh, first of all, I don't think it would have happened. But secondly, if it had happened, I wouldn't feel such a sense of anxiety about the country. I'm sorry, can I stop you there? Yeah. That, that was interesting what you just said. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Donald Trump was a stronger candidate than the other Republicans? Yes. You would have beat the others, but you didn't beat him. Well, I don't want to speculate like that, but I think the fact he emerged and the way he emerged, which was so unlike anybody ever getting a nomination in recent times, uh, demonstrated 
the strength he had, which was really rooted in a very cynical assessment of how he could build a Republican uh, majority. He started on the very first day, you know, saying terrible things about Mexican immigrants, you know, that they're, they're, they're rapists and criminals. And all of a sudden, people, you know, in the uh, Republican side of the electorate began to say, oh, somebody's speaking to me. And then he went on from there. And all of his dog whistles and all of his appeals uh, began to coalesce in the primary. Uh, and then once he won the nomination, uh, he had some additional advantages like Russian help and, and you know, sophisticated data analytics operation, weaponizing information, all of that. Um, but he, his core base, and he was, he was right when he said, I could shoot somebody in the middle of Fifth Avenue, my supporters won't leave me, because he was in a visceral way feeding into their prejudice and paranoia. That's an argument that Donald Trump was stronger than other Republican candidates because he was willing to play white resentment politics mm -hmm. in a way that others weren't. Is that a fair reading of what you just said? I think that's part of his appeal, yes. And he was willing to play, let's not forget, Islamophobic politics, homophobic politics, sexist politics. I mean, he hit every single area of resentment and grievance that people were feeling. And his racism, which was endemic to his campaign, uh, wasn't subtle at all. Uh, and there's now been so much analysis done since the election demonstrating clearly that, you know, so-called cultural slash racial anxiety and prejudice was the primary driver for a lot of his support. One way of reading the election results mm -hmm. is that Donald Trump, through these appeals, was able to get white voters to act as an interest group, to coalesce them in a way they had not recently been coalesced, to motivate them, particularly downscale whites, in a way they had not recently been motivated. That didn't happen as much with women voters. Um, you talk about watching the women's marches after mm -hmm. the election and thinking, where was this solidarity? Where was this outrage during the campaign? Why do you think that politics worked for Trump, but you didn't see a corresponding surge, particularly among female voters? Well, let's, well let's start with this fact, though. I did carry the women's vote. You did carry the women's vote. Right. I lost the white women's vote, but I actually got more white women votes than Obama got. So this was part of a trend. In, 20, in 2008? In, I think, I can't remember, it was 08 or 12, yeah. And so white voters have been fleeing the Democratic Party ever since Lyndon Johnson predicted they would. There is no surprise to that. Of course I hoped that I could get more than a traditional Democratic nominee did because I was the first woman with a chance to be president. But gender is not the motivating factor that race was for President Obama. And so many women, uh, and let's talk about white women because that's the group of women that I lost, um, are really quite uh, politically dependent on uh, you know, their view of their own security and their own position in society, what works and doesn't work for them. So as I say in the book, I had this really revealing conversation with Sheryl Sandberg before the campaign, and she's immersed herself in every bit of research about how do women think and what do they expect. And she said, look, and we're talking predominantly about white women, okay. She said, the research is really clear. The more professionally successful a man becomes, the more likable he becomes. The more professionally successful a woman becomes, the less likable she becomes. When a woman is advocating on behalf of others or working for someone and working hard for that person, the way I did as a Secretary of State when I was so popular uh, in the public opinion polls, that is favorably received by people. But when a woman advocates for herself, so if I go and say to Vox, you know, I think Ezra deserves a raise, people say, boy, is she a good person. I mean, she's out there advocating for Ezra. If I go and I say, you know, I think I'm working really hard and I think I deserve a raise, it's like, wow, what got into her? What's the deal? So Cheryl ended describing all this to me by saying, remember, they will have no empathy for you. Now, I believe absent Comey, 
I might have picked up one or two points among white women. I'll give you the example I use in the book. So before the Comey letter on October 28th, I was 26 points ahead in the Philadelphia suburbs. That could have only happened if I had a big vote from women, Republican women, independent women. A week later, two, uh, 11 days later, I win the Philadelphia suburbs by 13 points. I needed to win by 18 points to be able to counterbalance the rest of the state. That wasn't just me. That's how Democrats win Pennsylvania in presidential campaigns. It stopped my momentum, and it hurt me, particularly among women. And I have so much anecdotal evidence for this. And now researchers are starting to pull some of this together. You know, all of a sudden, the husband turns to the wife. I told you, she's going to be in jail. You don't want to waste your vote. You know, the boyfriend turns to the girlfriend and says, she's going to get locked up. Don't you hear? She's going to get locked up. I mean, all of a sudden, it becomes a very fraught, kind of conflictual experience. And so instead of saying, I'm taking a chance, I'm going to vote, it didn't work. So I think that there is a lot of work still to be done to try to appeal to as broad an electorate as possible, but not by sacrificing the constituents we have who have stuck with us, who are part of a uh, majority if they aren't suppressed and if they, you know, can be motivated to turn out. And I hope that happens in 2018. The premise of, of a lot of these conversations, you, you would imagine what we're talking about is persuasion, right? You imagine we're talking about how do a candidate, you in this case, mm -hmm. get the most votes, which, mm -hmm. but in this case, you did. I did. And, and one broader question that you don't really take on in the book, but since the turn of the millennium, 40% of the presidential elections have seen the popular vote won by Democrats. That's right. And seen the result overturning the Electoral College. That's right. Which is just crazy in these days. Do Democrats have a democracy problem? No, we have an Electoral College problem. Should there be an Electoral College? As far back as 2000, I said no. I mean, I think it's a, uh, you know, it's an anachronism. Uh, and look, I won in counties that produced two thirds of the economic output in the United States. I won in places that were more on the optimistic side of the scale than the pessimistic side. I won in places that understood and appreciated diversity. I won in places where African American and young voters were not suppressed as they successfully were in, for example, Wisconsin and other uh, locations that I didn't win. So I think you have to take this and pick it apart. If, if you come with just one answer, uh, it's not going to give you what you need to go forward. But at the end of the day, if you look at where we are right now, if we don't convince, and when I say we, it's the great big democratic we, not me, but if we don't convince uh, people to register to vote and vote, the simplest exercise of your citizenship in our country in the 2018 election, then I really do think we're going to see the clear and present danger to our democracy that I've been talking about come to fruition. We will see a constitutional convention. Now, whether it ever finally gets ratified, I'm not sure, but it will be so divisive and it will rile up so much of our uh, population. We will see the continuing efforts on the right to disenfranchise people, uh, to roll back regulations that are good for our health and our our environment and so much else. We will not recognize America. So part of the reason I wrote this book was not just to say, OK, there's a lot of theories floating around. Here's what I think happened. And I've got evidence behind what I say. And I hope you'll pay attention to it. Because if we don't, what happened to me will continue to happen. And I don't want to see that in America. But one question about that is, is actually about where the geography of that is going. You, you talk about winning more of the economic output mm. of America, probably than any Democrat has before. Yeah, probably. But part of that is that Democrats are clustering in urban centers, they're clustering in big states, and the American political system is not built to advantage that. It's built to disadvantage that. Well, but and it seems to me that the Democratic Party could be in a position where it is winning a lot of moral victories, it, it, but no, it's I'm not, not winning interested. a lot of elections. I'm not interested in that alone. I mean, obviously, yeah. if we don't win elections, we don't win. But there are pieces of this you can address, Ezra. Let's start with voter suppression, which is one of the five reasons why I believe I lost. Compare Wisconsin to Illinois. 
or Wisconsin to Minnesota. Wisconsin has had a concerted voter suppression campaign going on under Scott Walker and the Republicans. The AP says maybe 200,000 people were turned away. Illinois has had none of that. In fact, they've made it easier to vote. Minnesota is a easier to vote state. I won both of those. You've had voter suppression in Michigan. You've had voter suppression in Pennsylvania. Now, that's not about me. That is about what is right and decent and constitutional. And I was shocked when the Supreme Court threw out the guts of the Voting Rights Act. I was in the Senate. I voted for it. We voted 98 to nothing. George W. Bush signed it, and along comes the Republican majority on the Supreme Court, and they throw it out, and Republican governors and legislators could not have been more gleeful. Now, that is not a big, you know, ticket item. That is hard work. We need to elect legislators. We need to elect secretaries of state. We need to bring court cases. Because if we don't deal with this voter suppression, yeah, the electorate will continue to shrink. And it won't just be the electoral college. It will be within these states a shrinkage of the legitimacy of our constitutional democracy. So I, I care passionately about this because this will determine what kind of country we have for my grandchildren. And so I'm going to be out there day in and day out trying to do what I can to support efforts to, you know, give back voting to people, whoever they are, across our country so that their voices can be heard and we have a democracy that really functions right. Hillary Clinton, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.